Welcome back to another episode of What's On Your Mind. Joining me on the call today, I've got Raj Malhotra and Chris Cathy with me. Uh, gents, great to have you back on the show. Now, on our on our last episode of What's On Your Mind, that was a couple of weeks ago, we had Ross Williams and Jason McDonald on the call. Um, and they provided some pretty sobering comments and pieces of advice for retail traders uh, trading this environment, which was essentially, if you don't need to trade, don't do it. Now, since then, we've seen a bit of a rally in equities. Uh, we've also seen, you know, a continued elevation of volatility with that. And so kind of with that in mind, Raj, I was wondering what your general outlook is about that and, and what you think of the, the consistently high level of volatility that we're seeing as well. Yeah, well, well, first of all, thanks for having me back on. And hello, Chris, hope you're safe in um, both of you, Chris, is hope you're safe in the UK. Uh, but anyway, um, in terms of the <laughs> VIX here, I think it's, hope you don't have coronavirus. Yeah. Um, in terms of the VIX here, and, and when, when we look at the level, it's been consistently above 50, as high as in the mid 80s, basically all the month of March. And what, what to me, the, the, the most important thing to take away from that is when the VIX gets over a certain level, say 40, the correlation among stocks goes to one, which means that all stocks go up, all stocks go down, save for the few coronavirus stocks like Zoom and some other biotechs. But basically, when, when, when professional traders say the market becomes un, somewhat untradable, it's because the long shorts don't necessarily matter, because they all go up, they all go down, and they don't go down for fundamental reasons. They go down more so because of positioning and what funds have to liquidate and what funds are, and forced selling and forced covering. So. All, all the trades that um, seem to make sense, especially in technical analysis, that's completely worthless in this market because there are no technicals at all. It's all just driven by one event, in this case, coronavirus, even more so than any of the other long periods of, of inflated volatility which you've had. So I think one thing to really take, um, uh, take from this is, number one, if you're trying to put any option strategies on right here, there's no one size fits all trade. That's that's always the, that's always the case, but even more so now. And also, you, you, what you want to do is make sure you look forward and use this time if you're not trading to think about this. Think about how the world is going to look different when everything comes becomes quote unquote normal. Because while while eventually this thing will pass, there will be certain um, elements of this that will all well, that will permanently affect human behavior. Like if you go back to 9/11, travel was permanently change forever. And some can argue in a good way. Like for me specifically, in terms of air travel, when I'm going through lines now, I can, um, if I give up more of my information, I'm able to wait in shorter lines and not wait in the line with the moron that doesn't understand that a metal buckle belt will go off of the metal detector. So I, I really think that it, to put a positive spin on this, there will be some good long term to come out of this. Uh, but again, you have to think of, you have to look at that going forward and use this time to think about that and think about what industries and what kind of companies are going to long term benefit from this as opposed to trying to pick the bottoms on leisure and some of those other stocks that have just been outright massacred. Does that how does that uh, fit in with with your sort of outlook? How you say it, Chris? Well, I think um, Raj words very very wise about volatility yes we we, we um one of the things that we talk about the institute is a long short portfolio which um implies that which manage is manageable and is successful when volatility is anywhere sort of in the sort of teens to even sort of low 20s but uh, when we've got a, not a stock market but we've got a market of stocks so economic fundamentals are driving earnings are driving uh, equity prices all things being equal obviously real interest rates but like Raj says, when we get into the sort of 40s, 50s, and we've seen spikes up to into the 80s, then it no longer becomes a market of stocks. We're looking at a stock market. Everything either goes up or everything goes down. And that, to, to make it that simple, it really is that simple. And like Raj touched on, it's the, you know, it's, it's positioning, it's technicals are irrelevant. Almost economic fundamentals, to a large extent, become irrelevant because this is all about positioning. When we're seeing the S&P limit up or limit down, this is pain. We, yes, they're all. You can make money in these situations, but generally, when you see the market limit down, that's forced liquidation. And I've got to stress this: this is forced liquidation. These are people are being forced to cut positions. Now, and I think with them, um, you touched on Ross and uh, Jason's um, "What's in your mind?" 
uh, the, the last one that we did was um, wise words again that um, as a retail trader, if you don't need a trade, which you don't, then don't unless you have high conviction and keep it tight, keep it sh smaller positions, keep things tight, just don't be a hero because like Raj says, when we come out of this, and we will come out of this, there will be some opportunities and this is where we can think about how we think the world is going to look. But right here right now in the, um, I mean, the performance of equity markets over the last um, six weeks, well, even shorter, is um, clearly the first quarter numbers globally are going to be an absolute disaster. So the market is clearly priced in that we are in recession. The first quarter is going to be horrible. And I would say that any earnings guidance going into this are almost like sort of probably almost irrelevant because one thing that corporates will do in this environment is that if they have any issues, they will write off as much as they can do to using the virus as an excuse. So really sort of guidance going into this this year reporting season is going to be sort of pretty useless. So they're, they're going to be throwing the kitchen sink at a situation. Now, like Raj says, this makes that um, elevator volatility, a long short portfolio is very, very difficult. And also the work to do about, uh, to generate ideas for long short portfolio can be more problematic because of you have sort of clearly question marks about earnings guidance. Now, one thing that I would say that for me, the, the whole crux, the whole number of the, uh, the view right here right now is like, how much is priced into the second quarter? What are the second quarter numbers in the US? What are they going to look like? Are they, the market, I would say, is clearly priced in the first quarter of a new disaster. Second quarter, only time will tell. But I just want to sort of bear in mind, like, remember going into this, S&P was an all-time high, but also the size of the US corporate debt market is an all-time high as well as a percentage of GDP. So yeah, there is clearly going to be some financial implications um, for what's going on right here right now. But um, back to you, Raj, maybe you've got a long, short idea you want to talk about. So um, yes, yeah, so, so what Chris said, it's really important to know that earnings right now don't necessarily matter because the earnings, especially in Q1 or even Q2, because like you said, they're probably going to tank everything. And also no one can know the, the, the expectations what the E is. No one has any idea what the earnings are in a PE ratio or earnings growth. And more importantly, like even going back a little bit, when, when economists are trying to model what Q2 GDP is, no one has a clue. No one has any clue on what that is. I mean, it, it literally is, let's say tomorrow, there was, we said we have a treatment that is 100% effective. Well, then the, then the GDP um, model that you just put out is completely irrelevant. So you're, they're, what they're doing is, remember, the, they're trying to predict something where right now there is abs nobody has a clue of what the end game is, of how this ends. So the, the GD, when people ask them what the GDP is going to be or how much of recession is going to be, it doesn't matter. It's completely irrelevant at this point. Yeah, so it's all it's all about that one. It, the, remember the remember this is very important. At the end of the day, the market they can if you tell them how many deaths it's going to be, that would be a, that would be a positive, even if it's an astronomical number, because that that because that creates certainty. It's the uncertainty that drives these big moves. Yeah. So having said all that, there are some names that I've been looking at that I that I that I a lot of them I looked at before this. Event and somehow and, you, and look for companies you think that could possibly benefit longer term from this. I, I know I talked about one of my last. Um, what's on your mind was DocuSign, but it, companies like that that are in technology. As you think people have been working from home. I think you'll see a shift where more people will be able to either work at home more or also or more importantly just be able be able to be prepared in case another the next pandemic happens that they will seamlessly be able to work from home. <clears throat> but another one that I really like and I liked beforehand and I like even more so going forward is a name called, called Teladoc, T-D-O-C. Um, the market cap is about 11 billion, which is very small to, uh, uh, in terms of where I think it could go. Um, Teladoc's the market leader in the telehealth industry. If you live under a rock and don't know what telehealth is, it's basically providing healthcare services via phone, video conference, and mobile uh, application so whether it's um and and they basically connect you to a large network of doctors and whether that's non-urgent needs like the allergy or minor infections or like really complex chronic conditions where you can't go to the doctor immediately like heart failure or cancer you can you can connect with your doctor through your phone and that to me is it solves two big challenges for the industry rising cost and that and, and accessibility I mean, and, and Teldoc specifically, they have the largest end-to-end -end solution in the marketplace where scale is critical. Um, another thing is they're, they're, they're the only one that's publicly traded. 
And I think what's if and I'm looking back at in, in the uh, last couple of months before coronavirus hit, some of the some of the things they did were they made strategic acquisitions to diversify their business. They bought a big company called Medicine Direct in France, which has become the market leader. And I think, as you know, in Europe, if you look at the European um, potential of this game, we already know that the whole European market is undersized, understaffed due to socialized medicine. So having and, and as of right now, it's, and as bad as things are in Europe, if you had if you were able to connect to your doctor through this medium, a lot of lives could be saved. And I certainly think that as we go forward, for both the doctor's sake and patient's sake, if you're a patient, do you really want to go to the doctor? Or you really want to go to the hospital right now? That's the last place you want to be if you think you're sick. So, and the doctors, do the doctors really want to see patients with coronavirus? No. So this solves that problem. And, it, and it's, if you, and you very clearly, it's safer for both parties involved. So they've been buying these smaller companies um, around, uh, around the U.S. Right now, they're the market leader. If you put up this chart, you can look uh, at the downloads. Um, they, they had about 60,000 downloads in February. The next one was Doctors on Demand and MD Live. Those were uh, much lower. But to me, Teladoc is the leader. So you want to, if you want to, if you want to invest in an industry, you always want to invest in the leader. If you think the industry itself has growth, Teladoc also has a much better name. I mean, let's be honest. As stupid as it might sound, having a ticker and a name that's more memorable actually brings people to. You know, uh, to your website. I mean, what what more can you say about Teladoc as a telephone doctor? But um, and you know, they're they're actually in now CBS and um, Rite Aid. But this one stat I read the other day, and this is I think the most important stat to remember if you talk about the telehealth industry. So I I read a poll that said 66 percent of consumers are willing to use telehealth. That's two thirds of the, the world, but only eight percent have currently tried it. That have currently tried it. So what better event than this global pandemic for people to try something that in their mind is safer, um, easier. And, you know, it, for those two reasons, why, why would you not try telehealth right now? Especially if you had something that, you know, in your mind, not life threatening and you don't necessarily need to see a doctor in person. So I, I, I personally believe this market, is going to eventually be similar to a thing like Amazon, where there's a one winner takes all. If you look at like the way the health industry is, um, having an end, an end, end, end solution for large healthcare providers, either they have to build their own platform, which is very costly, and we know healthcare providers are bad at that, or they can just license Teladoc. And the other risk is a, a company like Amazon, Facebook, Google, the, 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 those guys want to get into this market. But if you think about it, it, it because of um, the cost of acquisition, it would make much more sense for them to pay, you know, 25, even 50 billion for Teladoc and just put it on their platform. So I, I personally think this is a home run trade in three to five years. I think this could easily be a hundred billion dollar company, which is eight times higher from here than it is. I think they're going to dominate the long term. I think this industry as a whole is just in its... It's in an infant stage, and I think I don't see why these guys couldn't be the leader in it. Um, I've been in the stock since 100 bucks. This was way before any of this happened, so I bought more at 140. So I'm pretty long right here. Uh, in terms of options itself, um, I don't really. Actually, I can I can I can touch on the earnings last uh, and earnings and revenues this year in when they report Q1. They're supposed to earn negative 35 cents, which is up 18% from last year. Year and their revenues are supposed to be um, up about 34 from Q1 um, last year, and that's similar for a full year 2020. Again, I don't think it really matters so much yet, but you want to at least you want to know those and see what the market was expecting. But again, it, when when they report, the thing that's most important is what they're going to say about their future and how this is how they've been affected by. Um, coronavirus and how what they're doing to address these issues and how it's going to happen going forward because like i said once the world becomes normal again i don't think that i don't i think telehealth is only going to grow for those reasons and like i said in terms of structure the options look the options are very expensive here 
Uh, if you weren't long on the stock already, um, possibly just get long stock and just and just uh, look for better entry points. What I did was I actually overwrote my position. I have a massively long position. I overwrote. I sold the um, April 175 calls for uh, 12 bucks. I, th I think that's that means I, I get taken out at 187. If I sold out the stock essentially at 187, the stock that I bought at 100 in January, uh, I'm fine with that. I still think though I'd want to get back into it. If you want to be a little more creative, you can sell the May 180 calls. They're around 16 bucks. You do sell earnings, but again. I, I think that's that's still a pretty good risk reward if you want to take some money off of the table. I also one more structural thing about this: hedge funds are a lot very in this name right now. So what I, I'm almost hoping happens is that on earnings, because of overcrowding in the name, the stock sells off, and the weekends punt out of the name, and then I'm and I'm willing to go in there and buy a lot more. So that's that's one of the names that I really like here. I can touch quick on a short idea right here and. You know, it's harder. It, it, believe it or not, it's harder to find long-term structural shorts here because it's uh, yeah. everything is down so much and the expectations are so bad. But one name that I've actually been short a while, which even, was even before coronavirus, uh, was WP, <laughs> which is the world's biggest advertising firm. Turns out it was a crappy stock then, and now it's even shittier. <laughs> Ironically, the name sold off 20 plus percent on the earnings date last time. Uh, last time, and it's down another. 20, 30 percent since then. I mean, last if you look at their last year's report, they missed they missed earnings by 37 percent, which is almost impossible to do in in, in uh, this market here, where where they constantly under um, where they tend to under uh, estimate and overperform. 37 percent is just literally like a that's a complete dumpster fire. Um, they've announced layoffs. They're basically what they're trying to try to do is they're trying to lay off everybody and. Um, build the business back up that way, but that's not sustainable. Bank Capital bought a big piece of the company to try and turn around, but even I don't I don't even think they can. The biggest issue right here with them is we're they cannot compete in the digital age of advertising with social media. They just cannot they this they can't compete with social media anymore. This is not Mad Men anymore. This is the new way of advertising. And the, their their companies they're switching their business model right here by firing all old people and they're they're like and they're trying to um, essentially manage company's social media and their software sales SAAS relationships and their integration. But the thing that makes no sense is why would a company pay WPP, an old advertising firm, to manage those relationships when they could hire companies like Accenture or IBM, which are not ad agencies that actually understand the data and understand what a company needs to do in advertising. Or why wouldn't they just hire someone like Salesforce himself and just have, have their business team consult? It, does, it makes no sense, the business model anymore. Like the only way this works is if they can, if, if these guys and other ad agencies can convince the market that they're capable of managing the dynamic shifts in the industry. And why would you hire the oldest, most um, out of date business model to manage the shifts in your business? That makes complete. That makes that makes no sense whatsoever. And to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised in a few years if this company becomes like the uh, the blockbuster or the Eastman Kodak of our time, where their business model is just <laughs> they can do to save it, and it's just dead. Structurally, um, the trade that I that I put on recently was I sold the April thirty two and a half puts for a buck and a half. I'm sorry for the April thirty puts for a buck and a half. And bought the November 32 and a half puts, puts for six and a half. So right now that's, I'm sorry, five and a half. So basically I paid $4 for that spread. Um, the, the I took advantage of the inflated April volatility in this name. Because I, I don't think necessarily this thing's going to happen anytime soon. Advertising is so far off everybody's radar right now. It's just going up and down in the market. So you're selling, in my mind, a pretty dead month of volatility. And also... With, with the new travel restrictions and with the new travel uh, advisory in place, people are going to have to stay home for now. So maybe you'll see a bit of a pause in April. And but longer term, this business model just hasn't it has nothing in my mind. Again, though, I want to do any puts because stocks become very uh, cheap historically. Maybe some maybe bank capital will try and take it LB do an LBO. Maybe they can try and sell it to somebody else that will think they can turn around. 
a fledgling franchise. That's not unheard of. I don't think it makes sense. But again, remember, remember this: when it's that price, all you take is one idiot to step up. So, yeah. And uh, Chris, I know you said that um, you, you're not really uh, you, you're not really looking at new trades as such just yet in this current environment. But what about you know out the other side of this? What are the sort of things that you'd be thinking about in terms of managing your portfolio and potentially positions you might be looking at? Well, I think that we um, we have to acknowledge that um, at some stage we're going to come out of this. Now, um, is that I mean in the UK we've got we're kind of halfway through the um, the three week sort of window. Personally, I think that's going to be extended for at least another two weeks after that, maybe another two months, who knows. But we're sort of we're talking about early summer, best case scenario, late summer, maybe. But the whole question is what happens when we come out of the lockdown? If we have another outbreak of the virus, then all bets are off. And then I would suspect the markets will probably make new lows relative to where they were, were a few weeks ago, uh, last week. Um, if everything's fine, then yeah, well, because of uh, the, the central banks' issues, uh, central banks obviously, uh, rates have been cut hard. Uh, quantitative easing has sort of been stepped up massively. We've got governments that are doing all kinds of um, economic stimulus to the economies to keep things from being a complete disaster, which would suggest that if we have get, come back out of this and there is no uh, no, no re outbreak, then equity markets are going to have an absolute rip to the upside, no question. So yeah. you know we've got big downside, big upside, all questions when we when we do this and what happens when we come out of the lockdown. Now. I think one of the things that I'm going to spend a bit of time working on is just what I think the world is going to look like after after we're out. Now, are we going to go back to where we were two months ago or will there be something different? I mean, you kind of have to think about how has the world changed? Like Raj talked about um, 9-11 and what it meant for uh, air travel. What's going to happen to this? I mean, working from home, yes. Um, from my own experiences of businesses in the northeast of England, uh, yeah. There's been huge investment to make sure that this situation is manageable and is this going to be more rolled out so what's the implications for the world and how we work and how we relax um, and also given the fact that in western europe and in the us we've got uh, populist governments who um, tend to be sort of driving for small small state intervention but clearly we're in a state situation where governments are forced to bail out the economies and we're going to have a huge increase in government debt and what are the implications for rates well these are all things I'm going to be thinking about and see um, see how, how we look when we come out, but who knows when. What do you think, Raj? Yeah, I think that that's the most important thing to look at here. It's like you said, it's how it's going to look like at the end at the end of the day. I mean, what's going to happen is clearly rates are going to be low for a long time. So yeah. with with that, certain certain companies certain certain companies look good. Um, they're talking about big infrastructure bill in the U.S. That's yeah. probably good. That housing prices will. I'm sorry, housing uh, rates will be low, so maybe that'll increase home ownership. Uh, there's, yeah. there, you know, there, there's, there's there's tremendous stimulus that, as it's shown. What, what, as much as we hate deficits, it's a, a traditionalist like myself. There's no doubt in the short term, stimulus yeah. is positive for markets. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, do I think that that's going to continue? Yes. I, I I don't I don't see, I, I don't I don't see how. Uh, there, I, I think there should be some. Uh, there's be there. I think there is some pent up demand. I think the first three to six months of uh, the market um, after this comes out will be probably pretty good. But yeah. after that, we'll have to reassess. But you do have to, you know, you, you just have to assess the new normal. It, there will be a new normal, and some things will be very different than the way they were three months ago going forward. And trying to pick up on those trends early um, will follow stock prices. And you can kind of see the market's already kind of voting with certain sectors and yeah, certain yeah. names right now. Of just remember always, the market's always forward-looking. Yep. The market on the most basic level looks at forward uh, future expectations of three to six months. So, yeah, you can already see that in uh, stock prices right here. Yeah, I totally agree, man. I totally agree. And also, I think um, talk about sort of markets, but I think also, I mean, on a social level. Uh, people are going to go crazy when this lockdown's down. Um, I mean, there's going to be <laughs> clearly everybody's going a bit, uh, bit crazy being stuck at home so much. I mean, in, in Newcastle, there's a, there's a famous night, which is the Friday before Christmas, called Black Eyed Friday, when everybody finishes work for the Christmas holiday with Christmas bonuses, etc. And everybody goes crazy. That's going to be like a tea party because um, everybody's <laughs> going to get, get, want to get out and about. So yeah, 
It's, well, it's I, look for, similar. I look forward to spending that with you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> not always a good idea, man. Not always a good idea. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's not a Zoom video. Hopefully it's actually in person. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, gents, uh, I think we'll finish up there. It's great discussion as always. Um, good to hear your sort of general market outlook and also touch on some of those thematic ideas going forward, although possibly slightly early to implement some of them now, but great to hear about where we might be going and how we should be thinking when we come out the other side. And also um, really good to hear some individual ideas as well from you, Raj, and how you're structuring them. So once again, thank you both for coming on the show. Um, now, for, for all of you watching at home, uh, if you're looking to learn how to successfully manage your own money and trade your own money, um, then all you need to do is go to our website, itpm.com, where we've got lots of different educational resources up there for you. We've got courses, we've got mentoring with guys like Chris and Raj here. So you'll be able to learn and to think how they think in terms of developing your own ideas and managing your own money successfully. I'll put some links below the video so you can uh, find the information there if you can't find the website. Um, and that's it for this episode. I hope you all enjoyed it and make sure you join us again next time for another episode of What's On Your Mind.